Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. The call of Abram. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people and your father's household, to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's all there in the Bible. First book, take a look at the flow of the stories, spend some time this week looking at the Epic of the Patriarchs if you want to. It doesn't necessarily make sense to jump right in the middle of the action, but going back to the beginning in very great detail takes time. And with this being a digital service, people might just switch off after two minutes and go to make a cup of tea. Uh, it's kind of worse if they mute you. And then on YouTube, of course, you can speed the video up. So uh, you can hear everything that I say, but it takes less time out of your valuable lives. And it is a little bit intimidating to think that people might just skip through to get the gist and kind of not the context. A partridge in a pear tree. Really big turnip. Because sometimes the very best thing to do is start at the beginning, with the first things first. In the beginning, well, um, actually, we're not a hundred percent sure if we're totally honest. Um, not that I'm suggesting it's dishonest to believe in the greatness of God and that God created the world, um, but a variety of Christian scholars, all of them respected, have come up with a number of ways of viewing the Bible, and Genesis is a particularly tough read right at the beginning, um, and quite difficult to interpret, if I'm honest. And I'm not a biblical scholar, so Eden, uh, serpents incredibly long-lived gentlemen, which presumably equates to very cranky old men. Um, really, we need to understand how things unfolded a little bit after Noah went on his round-the-world cruise and planted a vineyard. Um, so it's Advent, and we are talking the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not quite the boy band you were hoping for, but... When God speaks to Moses, who is their descendant, when he introduces himself to Moses, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are the three chaps that he uses as a reference point to introduce himself. So it's a good place to start. Abraham is the father of nations. Uh, he is the one God calls to go and to become the figurehead of what will become God's people. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. It sounds a little bit sexist, I know, but it's literally true because he had many sons. Actually, he did. Um, and I'd love to unpack some of the kind of relationships and how his children and his close family then turn up later in the Bible. And it's all quite complicated, but we have the time. So uh, I'm recording a separate video to that. If you want to have a look, you're welcome. Um, but viewed with a New Testament understanding of Christ and who he is, Abraham is the first person God calls specifically to set himself apart for God's long-term plans. It's a plan of salvation. And before anybody says it, Noah doesn't count. That was a short-term plan and God promised never to do it again. So most of the cultures in the region surrounding Abraham were aware kind of of the cycles of things they thought everything went in rounds the sun has a daily cycle and an annual cycle the moon has a monthly cycle the um crops the rivers the rains they all come in their time and what happened before will happen again now 
it's very different for Abraham. He's given a specific version of a linear destiny. He's going to start here and he's going to end there. God makes specific promises to him that he will be the father of many and he will be used to bless many. He isn't going round and round in a loop. He's on a journey. And actually, we are familiar with that in our own culture. It's uh, something that we understand. X Factor contestants tearily saying they've been on their journey and, and we're reaching for the hankies and nodding along and understanding. We start here, we get there. Our future is not our past. They are different things. That simple concept was quite alien to the people that Abraham was surrounded by when God called him. And we don't often realise the full meaning of worshipping a God who is literally outside, beyond time. He's the same. His kingdom has no end. Abraham was called from a culture where everything went round and round to a life where God could call him, send him, and he wouldn't necessarily know where he was going to end up. And pretty much that's faith. And although he has his hiccups like anybody else, Abraham basically gets there. Right, so Isaac. Isaac is longed for heir and son arrives when Abraham is a hundred years old. It's a brilliant story. Go and read it. Um, he is the son of the promise. Isaac is the son of the promise made to Abraham. Uh, not Ishmael, uh, Abraham's eldest son. Um, he becomes the father of even more nations. But no, Isaac is the heir to the promise. He is the first born in marriage, but he's not Abraham's first son. But he is the guy who inherits the birthright. He is the legitimate heir. And that's really important because in a minute I'm going to fast forward 60 years and you'll see it happen again. Isaac is also the father of the faithful. So he has something to be faithful to. He's the one who moves backwards and forwards across the land that Abraham has already crossed, re-establishing wells that his father dug after the Philistines filled them in. He marries Rebecca, an arranged marriage with a member of his extended family. And the Bible isn't strong on the dangers of marrying close relatives until the law is given to Moses, so we'll let him off that. But Rebecca is unable to conceive, much like her mother-in-law, and after God hears the prayers of her husband, she bears twin boys, Jacob and Esau. Two less similar boys you could not meet. And so begins a rivalry that will once more upset the normal path of inheritance and set brother against brother, and eventually nation against nation. Literally. Keep up, Jacob is about to make his mark. Esau is Isaac's favourite. He's a hunter. He's skilled, he's cunning, he's successful. He thinks with his instincts. He doesn't think strategically, but he's right there in the moment. Jacob is his mother's favourite. He likes to stay in the tents. He doesn't want to be the kind of rough and tumble, rough and ready guy that his dad would like him to be, or might approve of. But the story's there in Genesis. Jacob buys Esau's birthright. Esau is the older one. He should get the birthright. No, Jacob buys it off him. Yeah. And then he cheats Esau even further. With his mother's help, he f fools Isaac, who is now old and, and not actually capable of seeing very well. Jacob fools Isaac into giving him the birthright blessing. And he literally takes it. So he, again, is not the firstborn but he becomes the acknowledged heir to the birthright. And Jacob then goes on to become the father of the tribes of Israel, and God gives him the name Israel, and we're there. We've arrived at the reason for the patriarchs being important, and that's why we need to start at the beginning. It's all there in the Bible. First book, take a look at the flow of the stories, spend some time this week looking at the epic of the patriarchs if you want to. It doesn't necessarily make sense to jump right in the middle of the action, but going back to the beginning in very great detail takes time. And with this being a digital service, people might just switch off after two minutes and go to make a cup of tea. Uh, it's kind of worse if they mute you, even if you don't know that at the time because you're not in their dining room watching them watch you. Um, but it's there. And then on YouTube, of course, you can speed the video up. So uh, you can hear everything that I say, but it takes less time out of your valuable lives. And it is a little bit intimidating to think that people might just skip through to get the gist and kind of not the context. But moving on, Jacob, he's got 12 sons and a daughter. 
And yet the promise to Abraham was for countless to descend, countless descendants, and that through him all nations would be blessed. Uh, we're not there yet, are we? We're barely at the point of needing a bigger minibus for day trips, unless you mean to take all of his children and all of their mothers. Imagine the scene. You work for seven years for a chap to win his daughter in marriage, uh, but he tricks you and you end up marrying her older sister. Then you work another seven years so that you can marry the right daughter. And then you have children <clears throat> with the older daughter and the younger daughter's handmaiden and the older daughter's handmaiden. And then finally with the daughter that you actually fell in love with at the beginning. Yeah, so you end up with 13 children from four different women. Um, but due to the combination of circumstances, apparently only one mother-in-law. Jacob's 15 when his granddad Abraham dies, but he doesn't father any children until he's over 80. So let's put that in perspective here. If I compare Jacob's family tree to mine, um, I'll put it up on the screen. I'm Andrew and I'm the son of David. And David is the son of John, the son of Harry, the son of Walter. He was born in 1862. That's far enough back for my purposes. My son Matt was born in 2003, when Walter would have been 141. Jacob was born when Abraham was about 160. It's comparable. So in the same time it's taken my family to trot through five generations, Abraham's family has taken nearly two. And if you time, apply the timeline pro approximately so that Abraham and Walter Clayton were born in about the same year, then the sons and daughter of Jacob are due to arrive in early next century. They're taking off slowly. But that's going to change because by the time of Exodus, when the Israelites leave Egypt, they're travelling great numbers under the names of their tribes, the sons of Jacob. OK, so quick test. And if you're going to do this properly, you'll need to get a pen and a bit of paper to write on, or a pencil, okay? And pause the video, because I'm done playing with time, and I'm gonna move straight into the test. So get the stuff if you need to. If you're not gonna bother, we'll move straight onto the question. And here it is, are ready? How many of the tribes of Israel can you name? Go. I need a timer. Oh. And done. Excellent. And here are the answers. Swap papers with your neighbour. One tick per name. Oh. Aren't 12 names after all. It's 13. That's because Jacob, Jacob isn't listed. Sorry, Joseph isn't listed. Jacob's son Joseph is uh, one of the youngest. And he isn't listed because his sons, um, Ephraim and Manasseh, they get a half tribe each. Um, and that's a tricky story as well. Um, okay, we're going to leave that for one moment. Well done if you got more than 10 out of 13. I generally don't when I'm put on the spot. And it's not the sort of quiz people like for Advent and Christmas Tide anyway. Let's um, move on. Two big points and a much easier quiz. Do you know the 12 days of Christmas? Yes, most people do. Everything from 12 drummers drumming right down to the Perennial favourite, the last line of every chorus, a partridge in a pear tree. Now, if I think of the partridge and tree as a single gift, but I get 12 of them, one a day, and then for 11 out of 12 days I get two turtle doves, so that's 22 in total. Next question, how many gifts do I get in total across the whole song? Again, I'm not going to wait, so you can pause to as long as you like to work it out. Ready? It's 364. One for every other day of the year apart from Christmas Day itself. Ooh. Now, yeah, that reminds me that God's promises are for the entire year round. 
it, it does, honestly. I mean, it's cheesy, but it's maths. Um, his promises are not single use. They're not one shot. They continue to be fulfilled all year, every year. I've already said that God's outside of time, and I meant it. His promise to Abraham comes true, and in the most remarkable fashion in the case of Isaac. And then when he's promised that he will be blessing other nations, that's fulfilled as well in Christ, in that salvation. But it's also fulfilled in us and through us. Jesus tells us we're the light of the world, right? So we're fulfilling God's promise to Abraham when we follow Jesus and bless those around us. And that's my second point. When God steps into Abraham's life, he doesn't make lavish promises just for Abraham. He makes some pretty outlandish promises for Abraham and Sarah, but it's about inheritance and the future and the total blessing of Abraham's descendants as well. And it's not the national lottery suddenly endowing you with a load of cash. We all know stories of people who blow it on holidays and villas in the south of France and high living and, you know, vast global tours on a ship, which brings us back to Noah, but I didn't intend to go there. I'm going to come back to where I am now. Um, and so sometimes it's contentment that matters more than stuff. We can have that promise fulfilled to us, but it's not necessarily about meeting a big target. It's about meeting our actual needs. Christmas TV is the stuff of the underdog. We watch it repeats every year, um, whether it's Del Boy and Rodney becoming millionaires or uh, it's Jason and the Argonauts finding the Golden Fleece every year. Um, what about smaller victories? Woody and Buzz survive their first big adventure together and drop back into the box of Andy's toys. How about the heartwarming moment in Planes, Trains and Automobiles when John Candy's terrible character, Del, gets invited to Thanksgiving dinner? Or in Blackadder, where all Baldrick really wants is a really big turnip. And he gets one. It's fun, but we see the same brilliant heartwarming moments on repeat. We relive the things that made us feel good before. Abraham moved beyond this by embracing a promise for his future that encompassed the whole world and God's big plans to save us. He's called by God. His son Isaac is the literal delivery on God's first part of the deal. And through Isaac's somewhat difficult relationships, first with his dad and then also with his sons, we see that though these guys are imperfect and make bad decisions, like the rest of us, Jacob is still lined up to become Israel. And through Jesus, God maintains his original promises to Abraham. God's promises are for all time and they are universal in the sense that when he promises to bless everyone through Abraham, he really means it. Everybody is welcome at God's table. Everybody can come to Christ. And when he does fulfill his promises, it's not necessarily a massive showy way that showers you with stuff you don't need or can't use. It's about meeting the needs of people where they are and us playing our part in being that blessing to others. And that's why this Advent, I hope we can, in the words of the Church of England's national campaign for this season, bring comfort and joy. We can be the fulfilment of God's blessing to others by our goodness to those around us. We can prepare our hearts to enter into Christmas in four weeks' time. We can celebrate that Jesus came down from heaven to live with us, share our burdens and bear our sins. And what a debt we would owe if God had not graciously given us his only son. And how much more can we graciously give to others as we fulfil God's promise to the very first of his people, the patriarchs, let us learn to live as they did, by faith in a God who keeps his promises. Because sometimes the very best thing to do is start at the beginning, with the first things first. <laughs>